This is lesson 3.2 on complex numbers. Uh, in the previous lesson, when we were solving some simple quadratic equations, we noticed that uh, at times we would perhaps need to square root a negative. And then we defined the imaginary number i, which was equal to the square root of negative 1, as a way to be able to solve uh, these sorts of quadratic equations. And using this, we can and the real numbers, we can extend that system into the set of complex numbers, which is anything that can be written in the form a plus bi. Now a, the a part, we call the real part, and the bi part we call the imaginary part. And if we want to visualize the set of complex numbers, maybe we use like a Venn diagram. So inside there is the real numbers, and also the imaginary numbers. And notice that there's no intersection between these two. The real numbers, you might have things like negative 3, square root of 2, pi, 5 thirds, 10, things like that. The imaginary numbers you're going to have like 2i, i square root 3, 7i over 6, i plus 2, Oops. not i plus 2, dummy. I go somewhere else. That's a thing, though. So you're going to have things like this, right? The complex numbers, these are going to be things that are of this form. So here's where like i plus 2 might come in, or 3 minus 2i, or 1 plus i squared 6, things of that nature. So technically, are the real numbers complex numbers? Yeah, right? The complex numbers is this outer box. Everything inside of it is a complex number, so the real numbers are a subset of the complex numbers, and the imaginary numbers are a subset of the complex numbers. So, for example, just doing some vocab, 9 plus 5i. What kind of number is this? This is a complex number. And the real part of this complex number is 9. And the imaginary part of this complex number is 5. if I say uh, negative 7i. Well, this is a imaginary number, but all imaginary numbers are also complex numbers. So here, the real part is 0. Notice there's nothing here. And the imaginary part is negative 7, the coefficient on the i. So that's kind of 
what we're talking about when we talk about imaginary and com or complex numbers and kind of what they are and what's a complex number and what's not a complex number. Uh, what we're going to do now is talk about operations on complex numbers. And the idea here is that we can treat the I just like we would an X. So if we're talking about addition and subtraction, wanted to do, for example, negative 7 plus 2i plus 5 minus 11i, we can treat this just like we would, say, negative 7 plus 2x plus 5 minus 11x. So we're going to treat it the exact same way. Since this is addition and subtraction here, I can get rid of all these parentheses because they don't really matter. And write all the subtraction as plus a negative. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to just combine the like terms. So that's negative 2 minus 9. Just like we would over here with x's. So it works exactly the same way. Okay, well, that's not so bad. Uh, the only thing we have to kind of keep an eye on is in the subtraction problem. Notice that we have a subtraction symbol in front of a parenthesis. So what does that mean? It means that negative sign needs to be distributed throughout the second set of numbers. I'm going to have 18 minus 2 plus 27i minus 3i. Or 16 plus 24i. Hopefully that doesn't seem too difficult. Oh, let's talk about multiplication. So let's say we have 3i times 2 plus, uh, let's say, 2 minus 5i. So again, what will we do? We'll imagine what would we do if we had x's. Well, in that case, I'm just going to distribute. We get 9x minus 15x squared, right? Oh, okay. So we'll do the same thing because we said we're going to treat these i's just like we would in x's. We're going to have 6i minus 15i squared. I don't know why I wrote different numbers here. I meant these to be the exact same problem because we have x's in there. Okay, so there's one little thing that's going to be different about these. Remember that we know what i squared is. We talked about this in the previous lesson. That i is the square root of negative 1. Excuse me, thank you. And the square root of negative 1 squared then is just negative 1. So we have negative 15 times negative 1. So it's going to be positive 15 plus 6i. And again, usually we write this as a plus bi. That's the only reason why I wrote the 6i there. So this is going to be the main difference between treating this like a polynomial with x's and treating it like 
multiplication of complex numbers is that you've got to remember to take care of those powers of i because they should all simplify down. Um, let's do another example. So let's say we have 4 plus 9i times 6 minus 2i. Well, again, if I, we said that this, we can treat this, all these problems, just like if we had x's. So if I did this, what I would do is I'd use FOIL. So first, outer, inner, and last, and remember here, when we get a squared term for the eyes, we're going to have to worry about that. So we'll do this the same way. So we do first, so 24 outer, negative 8, inner, plus 54, last, negative 18, I squared. So, I notice that these guys I can combine. This, I remember that I squared equals negative 1. Right, we just show why that's true up here. So I have 24 plus 46i, negative 18 times negative 1 is plus 18. And now I can add these two guys together. So that will be 40. Uh, let's do one more example here because there's an important um, thing that can come up. So again, uh, we will treat this just like we would a polynomial. So we'll start by formula. So first, outer. inner, and then last, and now I'll combine my like terms, so I notice 15i plus 15i, that gives me 0i, so I just won't write anything, and i squared is negative 1, so negative 25 times positive 20, or negative 25 times negative 1 is positive 25, so 9 plus 25 is 34. Notice here we have a real number. So there's no imaginary part here. That's going to become quite important when we talk about division. So if I want to, say, divide these two complex numbers, I'm going to think about it this way. And remember, when we said there were no radicals in the denominator, from lesson 3-1, we're also going to say there are no i's in the denominator. And do you remember how we got rid of the radicals in the denominator? We multiplied by the conjugate. So guess how we're going to get rid of the i's in the denominator? We're going to do the same thing. We're going to multiply by the conjugate. So we remember that for like 
the square root of 2, the square root of 2 is its conjugate. But that's not going to be quite right. So like if I have 2i, 2i is its conjugate. But what if uh, we have 2i minus 1? Well, now is where I'm going back to this previous example because I'm talking about how important it was. Notice here, let's make an observation, that this is like a plus b, a minus b. This is our difference of two squares factoring pattern that we saw before. Notice when we have a difference of two square factoring pattern going on between these complex numbers, we get a real number answer, something with no i in it. So my conjugate for something like 2i minus 1 is going to be 2 plus i. Come on, computer. Aha! So the conjugate of something like a plus bi is going to be a minus bi. So, going all the way back here, we had 3 plus 2i over 1 minus i. It's 2 minus i. So, we'll multiply by the conjugate. In this case, it is 2 plus i. So again, that is a super important observation. And just so you know, it works also up here. So there you go. Those two things are also conjugate pairs. So what are we going to do here? Well, this is multiplication now. So we'll do our foiling. 6, 3i, 4i, 2i squared over 4 plus 2i minus 2i minus i squared. And if I simplify up top, I have 6 plus 7i, and then this is negative 1, so I have minus 2. And down here I have 4 plus 0, and then i is negative 1, so I have minus 1. And I can combine some more up here, so I have 4 plus 7i over 5. And if I want to make sure I write this as a complex number, basically something in the form a plus bi, I'll write it as 4 fifths plus 7 fifths i. Notice that these are really the same thing. I've just written that common denominator as two separate denominators here. Okay. Um, so. The last thing I want to talk about is a real-world application, because probably most of us are thinking, okay, so like complex numbers, whatever, I'm never going to use that because it has the word imaginary in there, so it's like all made up and it doesn't really mean anything. You're wrong. So that real-world example is in electrical engineering, kind of an important topic if you enjoy uh, using any kind of part of modern technology. <laughs> so we're going to start with some uh, vocab here. So an electrical circuit is kind of what we're going to be talking about. So we'll talk about the different components of an electrical circuit. The three major ones are resistors, Conductors and capacitors.
So in a picture, in a circuit diagram that we're going to be looking at, the symbol for resistor is something like this. The symbol for an inductor is something like this. And a symbol for a capacitor is something like this. Part of my artwork because it's things. But I think, um, oops, you guys will be okay. So the phase angle, not super relevant to us, but if you know something about electrical engineering, which I don't know if anybody does, but you might, are those. Um, that's not so important to us as the representation as a complex number. And by complex number, I mean A plus B I. So this, the resistor, we can represent as a real number. Basically, the A. Uh, the inductor is the imaginary, is an imaginary number. And where that B value is positive. And the capacitor is also an imaginary number. But where that B value is negative. Let's draw a little picture of a circuit here. These symbols are here in a minute. And it looks rather intimidating, but the mathematics involved is not so bad. Okay. Uh, so this is a diagram for alternating electric current. Um, this is the kind where you plug it to the wall. That's an alternating electric current. If you have a battery, that's, um, oh, it's the DC. B is, uh, I don't remember what the DC stands for, but this is the kind that, like, you plug it into a wall. This is the electricity that's coming out. Um, so what you're given here, these values are the in impedance across each one of these components um, basically it's the resistance so like how much of a res resistance each one of these components gets the electrical current that's moving across it and the unit that electrical resistance or impedance is given in is an ohm. So that's what this little capital Greek letter omega means. That's that weird looking symbol there. That just stands for ohms. And this guy over here, the symbol we haven't talked about yet, is called the power source. And the unit for a power source is given in volts. So if we use our chart up above and we look at um, each, each one of these different components, we can write their impedance as a complex number. So for the resistor, That impedance is 4. This. Because it's the real number. And then 4 from here. The inductor is an imaginary number where the B value is positive. So it's going to be 3i. And 
And the last one is the uh, capacitor. And again, if I go to my chart, it's bi, where that b is negative, so it'll be negative 5i. So the sum of the impedance, so the impedance on the entire circuit then is 4 plus 3i plus negative 5i or 4 minus 2i. Oh, that's pretty easy. So if I just want to find the impedances for each component of the circuit or the sum of the impedances on a circuit, Basically, I'm just using my chart and translating each one of these ohms into a complex number and then adding it together. Um, so, if we say find the total impedance on the circuit, we'll do that kind of Maybe we could also ask, what is the voltage for each component in the circuit? So the key to doing this is using something called Ohm's Law. If you take a physics class in high school, uh, it's a good one. You should study electricity and magnetism in there, and you'll learn all about Ohm's Law. Um, but basically what it says is the voltage in a component is equal to the current at times the impedance. So this says voltage at a component equals the uh, current at the component times the resistance. Oops, or impedance is the term we're using. At the component. Okay. Um, and in this problem, we didn't give you enough information. We need a current given. If the current is 24 plus 12 pi, and I guess we need a given on that. Currents are given. So the voltage, that unit is volts. Current, that unit is amperes, amps. And impedance, that unit is ohms. And amps, sometimes we would be able to have it right, but oftentimes we'll probably just write it out. So, uh, using Ohm's law, the voltage at my resistor is going to be my, oops, my current, which is 24 plus 12 pi, times my impedance, which we found earlier was 4. So I multiply that through, and I get 96 plus my voltage at the inductor, well, that's 24 plus 12 pi, and then I go back and I look up the resistance on my inductor was 3 i, should be through, so that gives me, um, that's 72 pi, plus 6i squared, and remember that i squared is negative 1, so that's really negative 6 plus 
I. Again, remember I like to write uh, this is a three plus two pi. That's the only reason why I flip the order there. And the voltage across the resistor. Again, current. Oops, that should be 36. Sorry about that. Um, 24 plus 12i times negative 5i. Again, remember that you said the capacitor is negative 5i. And then you just distribute again. So that gives me uh, negative 120. I minus 60 I squared. And remember, I squared is negative 1. So negative 60 times negative is positive 60 minus 120 I. So there's the answer to this. Um, I want to point something out that you can do as a check. So if I take these three voltages, 96 plus Come on, 48i, negative 36 plus 72i, and 60 minus 120i, and I add them all up, guess what I'm going to get? So 48i plus 72i minus 120i gives me zero i's. Oh. 36 plus negative 36 plus 60 is 120. That's all these units are volts. Probably worth writing that out there. And 120 volts. That looks familiar. Wait a minute. If I go back to my original problem, what is the power source in? 120 volts. So if I add up the voltage across each component, I should be getting the total voltage on the circuit, which is indeed what I got. We found that electrical uh, voltage is conserved across the circuit. Oh, well that's a nice check. Um, that uh, basically sums this guy up. So the homework. I'd like you to do would be numbers 1 through 26.